everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage from Los Angeles of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2021. Lisa Martin with Dave Nicholson. Dave and I are pleased to welcome our next guest remotely. Stephen Hules joins us, the Senior Director of Cloud Services at Red Hat. Stephen, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Good to, good to be here with you, Dave. Talk to me about where you're seeing traction from an AI ML perspective. Like, where are you seeing that traction? What are you seeing? It's a great starter question here. Right? AI ML is really being employed everywhere, right? Regardless of industry. So financial services, telco, governments, manufacturing, retail, everyone at this point is finding a use for AI ML. They're looking for ways to, to better take advantage of the data that they've been collecting for these years. Um, and it really, it wasn't all that long ago when we were talking to customers about Kubernetes and containers. Um, you know, AI ML really wasn't a core topic where they were looking to use a Kubernetes platform to address those types of workloads. But in the last couple of years, that's really skyrocketed. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest um, from existing customers that are using Red Hat's OpenShift, which is a, a Kubernetes-based platform, to take those AML workloads and take them from what they've been doing traditionally for experimentation and really get them into production and start getting value out of them at the end of the day. Is there a common theme? You mentioned a number of different um, verticals, telco, healthcare, financial services. Is there a common theme that you're seeing among these organizations across verticals? There is. I mean, everyone has their, their own approach like the, the type of technique that they're going to get the most value out of. But the common theme is really that everyone seems to have a really good handle on experimentation. Um, they have a lot of very big data scientists, model developers that are able to take their data um, and do out of it. But where they're all looking to get, get our help or, or looking for help is to put those models into production. So ML ops, right? So how do I take what's been built on, on somebody's machine and put that into production in a repeatable way and then once it's in production, how do I monitor it? What am I looking for as triggers to indicate that I need to retrain? And how do I iterate on this you know, sequentially and rapidly? Applying what would really be traditional DevOps, software development lifecycle uh, methodologies to ML and, and AI models. So Steve, we're joining you from uh, KubeCon live at the moment. What's, what's the connection with Kubernetes and how does Kubernetes enable uh, machine learning? Uh, artificial intelligence, how does it enable it, and what are some of the special considerations to keep in mind? So the immediate connection for Red Hat is, is Red Hat's OpenShift is basically an enterprise grade uh, Kubernetes. And so the, the connection there is, is really how we're working with customers and, and how customers in general are looking to take advantage of all the benefits that you can get from a Kubernetes platform that they've been applying to their traditional software development uh, over the years, right? The, the agility, the ability to scale up on demand, um, the ability to have shared resources, to make specialized hardware available to, to individual communities. And they want to start applying uh, those foundational elements to their AI ML practices. A lot of data science work traditionally was done with high powered monolithic machines and systems. Um, they weren't necessarily shared across development communities. So connecting something that was built by a data scientist to something that then a, a software developer was going to put in production was challenging. There wasn't a lot of repeatability in there. There wasn't a lot of scalability. Um, there wasn't a lot of auditability. And these are all things that we know we need when we're, we're talking about analytics and AI ML. There's a lot of scrutiny put on the auditability of what you put into production, something that's making decisions that impact you know, whether or not somebody gets a loan um, or whether or not somebody's granted access to systems or decisions that are made. And so the, the connection there is really around taking advantage of what has proven itself in Kubernetes to be a very effective development model and applying that to AI ML um, and getting the benefits in being able to put these things into production. So, so Red Hat has been involved in enterprises for a long time. Are you seeing most of this from a Kubernetes perspective being net new application environments or are these extensions of what we would call legacy or traditional environments? They tend to be net new. Um, it, it, I guess, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's transitioned a little bit over time. Um, when we first started talking to customers, there was desire to try to do all of this in a single Kubernetes cluster, right? How can I take the same environment that had been doing our, our um, software development, beef it up a little bit and have it uh, apply to our data science environment? And over time, like Kubernetes advanced, right? So now you 
can actually add labels to different nodes and target workloads based on specialized machinery and, and hardware accelerators. And so that has shifted now toward coming up with specialized data science environments, um, but still connecting the clusters in that something that's being built on that data science environment is essentially being deployed then through, through a model pipeline um, into a, a software artifact that then makes its way into an application that, that goes live. Um, and, and really, I think that that's sensible, right? Because we're constantly seeing um, a lot of evolution in, in the types of accelerators, the types of frameworks, the types of libraries that are being made available to, to data scientists. And so you want the, the ability to extend your data science cluster to take advantage of those things and to give data scientists access to that, those specialized environments so they can try things out, determine if there's a better way to, to do what they're doing um, and then what, when they find out there is, be able to rapidly roll that into your production environment. You mentioned the word acceleration, and that's one of the words that we talk about when we talk about 2020 and even 2021, the acceleration in digital transformation that was necessary really a year and a half ago for companies to survive and now to be able to pivot and thrive. What are you seeing in terms of customers' appetites for, for adopting AI and ML-based solutions? Has it accelerated as the pandemic has accelerated digital transformation? It, it's definitely accelerated. Um, and I think you know the pandemic probably put more of a focus for businesses on where can they start to drive more value? How can they start to do more with less? And when you look at systems that are you know, used for customer interactions, whether they're deflecting customer cases or providing next best action type recommendations, AIML fits the bill there perfectly. Um, so when they were looking to optimize, hey, where do we put our spend? What can help us um, accelerate and, and grow even in, in uh, this virtual world we're living in? AIML really floated to the top there. Um, that's definitely a theme that, that we've seen. Is there a customer example that you think that you could mention that really articulates the value of that? Uh, you know, I think a lot of it, you know, we published one specifically around HCA healthcare, and this had started actually before the pandemic, um, but I think it's, it's, it's applicable because of, of the nature of what a pandemic is, where HCA was using AIML um, to essentially accelerate diagnosis of sepsis, right? They were using it for, for uh, disease diagnoses. That same type of, of diagnosis was being applied to uh, looking at, at COVID cases as well. And so there was one that we did in Canada with, it's called How's Your Flattening, um, which was basically being able to track uh, and do some predictions around COVID cases in, in uh, the Canadian provinces. Um, and so that one's particularly, I, I guess, kind of close to home given the nature of the pandemic. Um, but even within Red Hat, we started applying a lot more uh, attention to how we could help with customer support cases, right? Knowing that um, if folks were going to be out with any type of illness, we needed to be able to, to be able to handle that case, you know, workload without negatively impacting work-life balance for for other associates. So we looked at how can we apply AIML to help you know maintain and increase the the quality of customer service we were providing. It's a great use case. And did you have a keynote or a session here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con? I did, I did. Um, and it really focused specifically on that whole ML ops and model ops uh, pipeline. It was called Evolving with Kubernetes, Embracing Model Ops. Uh, it was for uh, Kubernetes AI Day. I believe it aired on Wednesday of, of this week. Yes, Tuesday, maybe. It, it all kind of condenses in the, the virtual world. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah, so one of the questions that Lisa and I have for folks, uh, you know, where we sit here, I don't know, was it year seven or so of the dawn of Kubernetes, if I have that right? Um, where do you think we are in this, in this wave of adoption? Uh, coming from a Red Hat perspective, you have insight into what's been going on in enterprises for the last 20 plus years. Where are we in this wave? Oh, that's a great question. Every time, like you, it, it's sort of that, um, cresting wave sort of, uh, of, of uh, uh, analogy, right? That when you get to top of one wave, you notice the next wave behind, it's even sure. bigger. Um, I think we've certainly gotten to the point where where organizations have accepted that Kubernetes um, can, is applicable across all the workloads that they're looking to put in production. Now this, the focus has shifted on optimizing those workloads, right? So what are things that we need to run in our in-house data centers? What are things that we need or can benefit from using commodity hardware from one of the hyperscalers. How do we connect those environments and more effectively target workloads? So if I look at where things are going to the future, um, right now we see a lot of things being targeted based on cluster, right? We say, hey, we have a data science cluster. 
it has characteristics of X, Y, and Z, and we put all of our, our data science workloads into that cluster. In the future, I think we want to see more workload specific uh, type of, of categorization of workloads so that um, we're able to match available hardware with workloads rather than targeting a workload at a specific cluster. So a developer or a data scientist can say, hey, my particular algorithm here needs access to GPU acceleration um, and the following frameworks. And then it's it, the Kubernetes scheduler is able to determine of the available environments, uh, you know, what's the capacity, what are the available resources and match it up accordingly. So we get into a more dynamic environment where the developers and those that are actually building on top of these platforms actually have to know less and less about the clusters they're running on and just have to know what types of resources they need access to. So sort of democratizing that. Steve, thank you for joining Dave and me on the program today, talking about the traction that you're seeing with AI, ML, Kubernetes as an enabler. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thanks, Steve. For Dave Nicholson, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live from Los Angeles, KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 21. We'll be right back with our next guest. software and technology industry for over 12 years now. So I've had the opportunity as a marketer to really understand and interact with customers across the entire buyer's journey. Hi, I'm Lisa Martin and I'm a host of theCUBE. Being a host on theCUBE has been a dream of mine for the last few years. I had the opportunity to meet Jeff and Dave and John at EMC World a few years ago and got the courage up to say, hey, I'm really interested in this. I love talking with customers.